thing around inside FDA and they were trying to organize them into a policy. And every time they would organize them into a policy at the bench and science level, and they would go up one level to the, where the policy people were, the policy people would overrule them. A month later, Olney and Turner filed a formal objection, stating that they believed aspartame could cause brain damage. But anyway, we, we filed our petition. Dr. Olney filed one and I filed one attacking um, the approval. And the FDA said, right, there are some factual, uh, informa some factual information that we should look into. We'll have a public hearing. Only because some of the investigators working for the Food and Drug Administration, looking at this data, knew that the data did not contain adequate safety information about aspartame. In 1975, due to serious questions over the quality and validity of G.D. Searle's testing of aspartame and other pharmaceuticals, the FDA formed a special task force to examine 11 of the pivotal studies on aspartame. Pivotal studies are those upon which the FDA bases approval or disapproval. Of the 113 studies, done on aspartame submitted to the FDA by Searle, 90 were conducted in the early to mid-1970s. Every test the FDA called pivotal was part of this 90. In March of 1976, the FDA completed their 500-page report after finishing their investigation. The um, report by the FDA uh, team that it inspected it is the most devastating report about research that has probably ever been written about a specific company. And uh, that led to a uh, series of hearings in Congress and came up with a $12 million appropriation to FDA to enforce uh, uh, good laboratory practices. But what happened is there's a policy resolution, but Nutrisweet and, uh, and Cyril got bypassed in the sense that they took this all over here and said, look at this terrible thing that's going on. There were a couple others that were going on at the same time. We've got to do something, and they did something. What they did was going forward, you have to meet these requirements. They didn't do anything about going backwards and saying, look, the stuff you're putting, the stuff you came through here is uh, killing people. Now, the reason they didn't do that at the time, because it happened in, 50, uh, in 75 and 76, is that it was the assumption of everyone in the process that the FDA was going to handle it. So FDA, one of the things FDA did that was so uh, striking and remarkable is that they, uh, knowing that they had this terrible situation on their hands, hired a, uh, a uh, group of pathologists. It's a pathology research group. FDA hired them to review the serial studies, but had serial pay for it. So the result was, here's a company which makes its money by being hired and paid for to do studies. Well, why would it do a study that was going to be critical of NutraSuite? In 1977, the FDA chief counsel, Richard Merrill, recommended to U.S. Attorney Samuel Skinner that a grand jury be set up to investigate G.D. Searle. Well, FDA did attempt to do something, and it, it wasn't the political part of the FDA. These were the people that really were trying to work and do well. Um, one of the counsel's lawyers for the Food and Drug Administration contacted the U.S. Attorney in Chicago and to bring an indictment against G.D. Searle for fraud, for uh, deletion of records, uh, manipulation of records, um, the falsification of records, and a number of other things on the testing that they did on aspartame and several other products as well. Suddenly, U.S. Attorney Samuel Skinner began preliminary employment discussions with G.D. Searle's law firm, Sidley & Austin. The U.S. Justice Department urged Attorney Samuel Skinner to proceed with the grand jury, pointing out that the statute of limitations on prosecution would soon run out. Samuel Skinner withdrew from the G.D. Searle case, and Assistant U.S. Attorney William Conlon was assigned to the grand jury investigation. Shortly afterwards, Samuel Skinner left his job to work for G.D. Searle's law firm. The assistant he left behind let the statute of limitations run out on the aspartame charges. This assistant, William Conlon, was hired 15 months later by G.D. Searle's law firm, Sidley and Austin. Uh, the common denominator for all of this, unfortunately, is money. And the amount of money that was flashed around um, induced people to drop the lawsuit against G.D. Searle and, and come work for the very firm that they were going to um, try for illegal activity. And that's what happened with the U.S. attorney. 
That's what happened with, with several people working for the Food and Drug Administration at that time. If they passed aspartame, literally, they were promised great jobs when they finished with FDA. Uh, and it was interesting, the main guy that made the decisions uh, that overruled them uh, in the Bureau of Foods went on to work for the uh, Soft Drink Association. And actually, seven of the key people that made decisions that kept NutraSweet moving through the process ended up working for one or another NutraSweet using industry. That's kind of an interesting side effect to the whole thing. I like to do well at things. It, it's important to me that if you're given an assignment that you try to do it the best you can. I'm afraid that some people confuse that with some sort of uh, single-mindedness on my part. Uh, Donald Rumsfeld uh, went into the company after he left Washington, after Ford lost, and uh, that would be uh, in uh, 1977 is in business and uh, he was the congressman from there and then he went to the White House where he was White House Chief of Staff and then he became the Se Secretary of Defense and he's involved in a whole group of people around Chicago that are um, uh, they're involved in a whole range of things national security being one of them he was also a part of the Rand Corporation one of the major defense think tanks and he's a very he's a very um, uh, he's a very uh, uh, bright guy, like in the best and the brightest, you know, the kind of people that brought us Vietnam. These are people who believe that thinking is the primary way that you get through life. Having values, feelings, and so forth, they denigrate. So he took over this company and it was, in, it was going down the tubes completely. It had FDA investigations, it had, um, it had uh, uh, grand jury investigations, it was losing money, its stock was down, a, f a person was hired to come in and explain why the FDA was so down on them and went through all of their records and said, you guys haven't got a chance. This company is, is a mess, a total mess. And he went in with a full team of politicians. He went in with himself, a politician. Uh, he brought his special assistant who was uh, uh, a, a Republican Party operative, worked with the Republican National Committee, brought in a press guy from there, brought in lawyers, and they took the, on the issue of this company as a political issue. And um, one of the first things that he, not first, but somewhere in that first year, it was late in the year, he called me and said, let's have a meeting. So I went and I met with him. We flew into the Madison Hotel and we met with, and we met and we talked. And my point was that the uh, struggle that was going on around NutraSuite was a scientific struggle. We needed to know the scientific answers. And this was before the public port of inquiry had ruled. We needed to know the answer. So why don't we, the people who were raising all of the questions about NutraSuite, and the company together create a, um, a set of protocols that we would agree address the serious questions that needed to be looked at to decide whether or not it should be, be marketed. So we had this meeting. And, uh, we, and uh, for about six months, his staff and I and, and, and our group negotiated out how we could proceed on this. His own scientists didn't want to do it. For example, at the, at the time that uh, they put their uh, evidence into FDA in, 19, um, in 1973, there were no requirements at FDA to examine effects on the brain from food additives. No requirements whatsoever. So there never was a study done to look at whether or not this affected the brain in, uh, in a neurological sense. The cancer studies were incidental. Those were cancer studies. But these were not brain studies. The cancer studies turned up brain tumors. But they didn't look, for example, at these holes in the brain or mental retardation or uh, lowering the ability of people to think or causing dizziness or blindness or any of those things. None of that was looked at. And uh, we were proposing that we design some studies to look at it. And uh, that was the direction I thought we should go. And I should say that at that point, I was involved with a group of people from uh, the food industry. We had created something called the Food Safety Council. We had 35 major corporations and it had a board that was half corporate people and half uh, consumer advocates, uh, academic people, environmentalists and so forth to look at the standards for food safety. And we had written a whole series of standards for food safety. Basically what I was saying to Rumsfeld is, why don't you bring your company into the same framework that all these other companies have agreed to be a part of? And, um, and uh, we had a very good, very full and frank exchange. His scientists kept jumping up and running around the room and saying, there's no problem, there's no problem, there's no problem. 
Ultimately, he made the decision not to find out what the facts were, but to move forward on the limited record that they had before them. And I believe it was a decision that was made that said we can, we can accomplish our ends better legally and politically than we can by actually doing the science to determine the outcome of the questions that are being asked. And in my mind, that demonstrated that he was an individual not interested in facts, not interested in the truth, not interested in finding out what the fundamental realities are, but much, much more interested in setting a goal and then, and then by will and force pulling all the resources that he could possibly pull together to achieve that goal, i.e. get NutraSweet on the market and sold. And so Donald Rumsfeld had been all these, in the, all these meetings and known um, all of these potentially harm, very harmful effects of this substance that he then went on and continued to market? Well, I, I, I can't say what Donald Rumsfeld knew or didn't know. Uh, he's not a scientist. He's not very interested in science from what I can tell. More or less, uh, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a fixer. He's, a, he's, a, uh, he's a, um, an operative. He, he, uh, you assign him a job and he goes and he does it. Uh, now, I'm, I'm sure that as he gets up into the level of Defense Department, he, he sort of makes up his own jobs and says, I'm going to do these things. But, the, but facts are not all that important to how he proceeds because he's so confident that he knows what the outcome should be that he will look, across, at least in the way he did a NutraSweet, he looked across the horizon to find all those facts that would support his position and then minimized or denigrated all the facts that didn't support his position. In 1980, the Public Board of Inquiry voted unanimously to reject the use of aspartame until additional studies could be done on aspartame's potential to cause brain tumors. The product was, uh, was uh, said not to be, it was ruled by law, it was said you cannot market this product. And then they had to go and do a political triage and get in there and manipulate the process. So, I mean, the, the manipulation was so powerful that uh, the first, one of the first things that Ronald Reagan did when he became president was suspend the authority of the FDA commissioner to take any actions. So he was sworn in in whatever day in January, and the next day he issued a, an executive order eliminating the FDA commissioner's authority to take actions. Uh, there was obviously a fear on the part of somebody that the commissioner was going to do something about NutraSweet or something else that would create difficulty, because it took him a while to get a new commissioner. It took him over, a little over a month to get a new commissioner, get the old one out and the new one in. And in that month, the old commissioner was prevented from taking any actions by an executive order. And that, that, that takes a high level of political clout to do that. But that's political triage on a situation that had gone sour uh, uh, because Rumsfeld had made the decision to um, uh, just power his way through and, and ignore getting the facts. In 1981, the day after Ronald Reagan took office as U.S. President, G.D. Searle reapplied for the approval of aspartame. Several